LOL, I'm good in my neighborhood. You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball. Today we are going to be looking at the Los Angeles Clippers and their season preview and to talk about the LA Clippers I'm joined by one of the hosts of the Locked On Clippers Podcast and that is Charles Mockler. Charles, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Josh. Good to have you on, Charles, to talk about this Clippers team who brings uh, a lot of uh, interesting pieces to the fantasy table, a lot of position battles, a lot of uh, depth at certain positions, shallowness at other positions. We've got stuff to talk about. Let's get to it. All right, let's get to it indeed. We will start by having a look at the projected record for this team. Charles, you didn't let me down because you are in the fine tradition of Locked On podcast hosts who have gone with the over <laughs> on their projected record. Vegas gone 36 and a half. You've gone 40 and 42. I guess the question there for you is, is 40 and 42 enough to make the playoffs? Uh, absolutely not, uh, <laughs> to put it bluntly. <laughs> um, not in this Western Conference. I think they're probably going to miss out on the playoffs again, not by a lot of games, but just by enough to where it's going to be, I think, a bit of a heartbreak for the fans. Yeah, it's, it does seem tough. You're, you're looking at what we were last year, 46 wins to, to get in the playoffs, and perhaps it gets a little bit tougher this year. Um, this Clippers team, the way it's currently constructed, appears to just be treading water at this point. But we'll see how yeah, what Jerry West decides to do throughout the season. But there's still lots for us to try and work out and, and figure out how it's all going to go down. And, of course, you do have the projected leading scorer on this team as Lou Williams, who was absolutely fantastic last season, the 35th best fantasy player. I didn't think it was going to be possible for him to be that good. Oh, I didn't think he was going to <laughs> yeah, play 33 minutes. Incredible. <laughs> I didn't think he was going to play 33 minutes a night. Like that's something that he just hasn't been doing. He was playing 35, 36 and this is because we had injuries to Patrick Beverly, Austin Rivers and Milos Teodosic all at the same time. So Rivers was playing every minute pretty much at guard, 22 and a half points, over 5 assists, a steal, got to the line in an inordinate amount of time, 6 attempts on 88%. Do you think Lou Williams is going to be playing 33 minutes a night this season? I don't think he's going to be doing that. Um, I kind of hope he doesn't uh, because that was, like you said, kind of out of necessity last year of just trying to throw some bodies on the court. Um, we got some young guys who can hopefully, you know, Doc doesn't like to give young guys minutes. No, but he does not. This year, yeah, hopefully this year he gets a little crafty because I think last year showed that Doc could really coach a lot better than I think some of the fans gave yep. him credit for. Um, I was one of those fans for sure. But I think Lou... He probably won't play as many minutes, but I still think he's going to be a super efficient scorer. Uh, when he's on the floor, he's going to be maybe not top 35 again, but he'll definitely be. I think he's one of the actually few Clippers you could really focus on if you're drafting your team. I think his minutes are going to drop, and I don't necessarily think they're going to go under 30 minutes, but I'm not ruling that possibility out. There is that chance he maybe goes back to 28 minutes. But you know, part of the thing, and this is something that's going to be hard to work out with the Clippers. You talk about Doc not playing the young guys. Now, he played a ton of young guys last season, but it was because he had to. But he also hasn't yeah. had the opportunity to play a young guy as talented as Shea Gildas Alexander. We're talking about Bryce Johnson or CJ Wilcox or <laughs> Reggie Bullock. These are guys where you go, yeah, okay, they're young guys, but they're not good. Yeah, Reggie Bullock's turning into an okay yeah. player, but these guys aren't good. <laughs> Shea is good. Um, now, whether he can force his way in to become more than the sixth guard, which is probably where he currently sits, you know, that remains yeah. to be seen. But I don't think he's coming in and playing big minutes, and Lou is still going to be anchoring this team, as they still have you know, designs on being a competitive playoff type guy. So I think Lou is going to be strong. It is hard to find these free throw percentage influence guys who get to the line as many times as Lou Williams does on such a high percentage. So that's going to give him tremendous value. I imagine the scoring drops, some of the assist numbers will drop as well, but he's still going to be solid around that 50 to 60 type mark rather than the top 35 where he current, where he sat last season, which again, I think is probably an unrealistically high expectation for Lou Williams. Let's 
move on to have a look at injuries. Now, we, we took, mentioned a couple of these names already, but we'll start with the rooster, Danilo Gallinari, who everyone <laughs> hates in terms of his injuries. 21 games. But one thing I, I want to get out here pretty clearly, Charles, is he's, he's healthy. He's playing at the moment. This is not a carryover injury. And I know people will be very, very hesitant to draft Danilo Gallinari because he always gets hurt. And, and that that's true. He does always get hurt. But his ranking is 183. His Yahoo ADP is 136. This is a guy that you 100% take if he is available in the last two rounds because we're talking top 60 upside. We saw him come back fairly strong at the end of last season. But just to reassure everyone, Charles, we know that he tore his ass muscle multiple times last season, which is a ludicrous injury. He broke his hand punching someone's head. But he is... He's fine at the moment. There is no lingering history or injury at the moment, despite anything having the possibility to go wrong with this guy. Yeah, he, well, it's nice, you know, he's not playing for the national team in FIBA, which is great. He talked with the team and he's back kind of rehabbing and making sure his body is in 100% tip top shape. Because he came into camp last year, uh, the reports were that he was a little out of shape. And if you already have kind of a history of injury, being out of shape when you go into camp is the complete wrong way to do it. Uh, Pretty much just kind of guarantee you're going to get hurt again. But this year, I mean, if, if you're getting him in those last rounds, that's amazing because he can put up 20-plus a game when he's healthy. So he's yep. going to be another scoring guy. The Clippers seem to have a couple of guys who, if you need scoring, it's for sure going to be there. And you might get some pretty good value off that late pick for sure. The other thing with Gallinari is that at the start of last season, he struggled to fit in with his team. He shot under 40% from the field. He wasn't as aggressive attacking. And part of his value... Can- like Lou Williams, was the fact that he was able to get to the line so many times. His last two seasons in Denver, 8.2 and 6.1 free throw attempts. Last year, just 4.1. But when he returned from injury, he was back up to over 5.5 per game free throw attempts on 86%. And he felt more comfortable. This was without Blake Griffin. He took on a larger role. And the shot, you know, it, it was bad. 38% in that uh, in the last <laughs> couple of months of the season when he returned from injury. Yeah, not solid. <laughs> but he's a better shooter than that. Like, he's not a great shooter. He's not a huge field goal percentage boost guy. But he is better than what he showed last season. And I think he is a prime bounce back guy. A pretty comfortable top 100 per game guy. Maybe even higher. And he is absolutely someone you should be looking at with a last pick. The other injuries, Milos Teodosic missed a ton of time with a full injury last season but he is ready to go but I guess Charles the question is with Milosh is um, yeah, is he actually going to be a part of the ro- the main rotation we've got Lou we've got Avery Bradley and we've got Patrick Beverly who we'll talk about in a second so where does Milosh fit in is he the fourth guard or will they put Shea there I think depending how training camp goes I still think Milosh might be ahead of Shea just for a little bit I don't think he holds on to that at all I think if Milosh just put ahead of Shea uh, I think Doc's maybe going to be forced to just realize that the potential of Shea and the athleticism is just a little bit better than Milos's nice creative passing and really no defense. So I think Milos is maybe a guy who you could definitely, I mean, I don't think you're looking to draft him. Um, if his assist numbers go up, that's great. But that plantar fasciitis injury is one that's kind of nagging and his age is something where it just seems like it might come back. And so, I don't know, I maybe steer clear of Milos. I don't know how much fantasy impact he's really going to have for the team. Yeah, he's he's unbelievably high on Yahoo. I don't know why he's ranked 114th. That might not seem high, but he's a, he's a guy who I think will struggle to crack the top 200. I, know, I like Milos, but it's all about a numbers game. Yeah. If he's clearly the fourth guard with the potential to go to the fifth guard, then that doesn't mean he's even an every night part of the rotation, let alone a 20 minute mm-hmm. per night guy. Yeah, in 22 minutes, he can get you four and a half assists and that can be useful as a streaming type option, but he is not coming in and and playing big minutes or even necessarily an every night part of the rotation. But the last guy we do need to touch on is Patrick Beverly, who we barely saw last season play just 11 games. Actually played pretty well, was the 66th ranked player on a per game basis. He's never going to be a high assist guy. Think of someone like DeJounte Murray, someone who ends up with more rebounds than assists, but he hits threes, Mm -hmm. he scored well, he'll get steals in high amounts. He had that uh, micro fracture knee injury, which is always a concern with um, with any sort of athlete. So what's the latest reports on uh, where Beverly's at in his recovery? Beverly seems to be doing well. Uh, he's been pretty active. I've seen you know, his posts on Instagram. He posts a little bit of workout videos and stuff there. So I think he's ready. He's a guy who's so hungry and seems to really have taken on this uh, leadership role with the Clippers, both kind of on and off the court. He was part of Balmer, had a big presentation the other week. And uh, – uh, Beverly was the only player there, it's like the only one who was chosen to speak. So I think Beverly's really embracing this team, and I think he's really ready this year to kind of come back and show everyone that he can still play at that level he was before the injury. Um, he's taken on a big piece of this team's identity, you know, with the Clamp City thing like that. And with all the young guys, I think he's just really hungry to show that he can get back to that level. 
What do you think that we're t- talking about with a role here? He, starting point guard, a starting point guard who's a 27-minute-a-night guy, a starting point guard who plays 31 minutes a night. Like, where is he fitting with these other guards around? I think, well, it's nice because, you know, he's kind of um, age-wise, he's getting a little bit up there for professional sports. And so with the amount of guards we have, I think you're right near that 27 mark. I think he's for sure going to start. Uh, his intelligence and defense is so good that, you know, we can't have – Milos and Lou on the floor at the same time because of defense, but we can definitely have Lou with Beverly out there because he can do some of the dirty work and stuff like that. So I think 27 minutes, that's probably right around where he's going to play. And another thing about this team is there's so many guards that I think there's going to be a lot of situational lineups, which I think might be frustrating for a lot of owners because some nights you're not going to know who's exactly going to get the keys to the offense. Uh, so to speak. I agree that's going to be the case, but Beverly, like Gallinari, is ranked very, very low, 168th on Yahoo, 142 is his ADP, so he is also an excellent late-round pick. Now, he doesn't have anywhere near the upside of someone like Gallinari, or if we're going to compare it to someone like Tyreek Evans, who you could draft in that spot last year, because he's mm-hmm. never going to be a high assist or high usage or high scoring guy, but he'll give you threes. He'll give you some strong point guard rebounds, and he'll give you high steal numbers um, and be a solid late round type of guy who probably can be a top 100 guy, maybe top 90, but I'm not sure it gets back to that 66th where he was ranked last season in those 30 minutes per night. That might be a little bit tougher for him to get to that level, but he is still a really strong value pick towards the towards the end of a, uh, of a draft that's coming up. Now, the breakout player you had listed here, uh, Charles, is the table, Montrez Harrell, who comes back. Uh, to be the backup to uh, March and Gortat ostensibly. But you know, Gortat is a guy who is not young. He is uh, 34. Yeah, he's he's going to turn 35 this season. I don't. A lot of people don't realize how old Gortat is. DeAndre Jordan's not around now. I can pretty much guarantee that Gortat won't play as many minutes as Jordan last season. Am I wrong, am I wrong in, this, in this guarantee? No, you're totally right. Um, I don't think... I mean, Trez, I, I, it's kind of a homer pick because I absolutely love Trez uh, on the Locked On Clippers podcast. We are very big Montrez Harrell fans. He's such a big energy guy. With DeAndre gone, you know, DeAndre was such, so high energy, such great athleticism. And Gortat, you know, can set screens and stuff like that. But, you know, Gortat never, say, dunks the ball. So he's not exactly uh, an electric buzz guy. And Trez is just that. And with the absence of DeAndre, everyone's rebounds are going to go up. But I think Trez's will go up you know, maybe three rebounds or so a game. And I think he's going to really just get a ton of, he's going to fill the stat sheet. You know, he's going to be kind of a utility guy. And I think I wouldn't be surprised if he took the starting job from Gortat, you know, quarter of the way through the season or something like that. I wouldn't be shocked with that as well. I think that's a legit possibility. We do have to Mm -hmm. pay attention to Harold because he's one of those guys that gets a little bit overrated fantasy wise. He was the 203rd ranked player last season, but in the, in the second half of the season where he played only 20 minutes a night, he was the 146th ranked player. So that gives you element of hope, but he was doing it on a 25% usage, which is obviously really high, especially for a center. But the reason his value goes up is because of that really high field goal percentage and high usage. He's never going to be a guy that gets that gets big amounts of blocks. He just doesn't do that. He's not a high steals guy. And as you've already referenced, his rebounding is really, really poor. But I like the point you bring up about DeAndre Jordan just hoovering in, in rebounds. We talk about this with our Andre Drummond in Detroit. When you play alongside Andre Drummond, your rebound numbers go down. And not that Harrell was necessarily playing alongside DeAndre Jordan huge amounts, but he still was. And that's going to have yeah. an impact on his rebounding numbers. So there is a chance for those to go up. He's historically, even in Houston, though, he's never been a super strong rebounder, although people look at him and go, I think he's like Kenneth Farid. And Farid is an animal, obviously, with that nickname in terms of rebounding. Yeah. <laughs> Harrell's not that guy. They might look similar with similar hair and have that same high energy, but they do differ in that area. So Harold has, I guess, limited upside with the lack of blocks and the poor rebounding, but I think his high volume, high efficiency game is really quite useful for fantasy. And again, if he takes that starting job off Marcin Gortat and becomes a 27 minute per night guy, then the top 100 is clearly within reach for Montrez Harrell. So I'm glad you agree with me about Gortat's minutes and with that chance of Harrell yeah. potentially <laughs> being that starter. Um, yeah, so the Clippers have obviously invested in him for the next few years. Gortat's an expiring deal. He's only 24. So there is still the best for him to come. I still have, I just have concerns about those certain areas of his game being able to improve. But I guess we'll see how that pans out as the season goes on. The two-way guys on this team, Charles, Jonathan Motley came across in the first ever trade for a two-way guy, and Angel Delgado was uh, was signed. Um, we saw the Clippers 
more than any team in the NBA used those two-way slots last season with CJ Williams and, and Ty Wallace playing chunks of minutes. But this, of course, was in large part due to the injury concerns. With Delgado and Motley there, it feels like yeah, and if everyone stays healthy, which we don't know at this point, I, I don't think we're going to be seeing the same level of play out of those guys as we saw from Wallace and Williams last season. Um, I I tend to agree. I am really high on Angel Delgado, actually. Uh, if you looked at his college numbers, he averaged about a double-double. Uh, he won the Carl Malone Award for the best power forward. He's got, uh, or maybe it was the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar Award. He's got so much hustle that he's kind of a mold of Montrez Harrell, but he gets more rebounds, you know. He's a yeah. hustle guy. He's got kind of these, like, nice... Not goofy, but like these little scoop shots that always kind of go in and you just kind of shrug your shoulders and then notice that he has like 12 and 12 or something like that. So if injuries happen, you know, our center position is pretty thin. We just have three guys. You know, Boban gets hurt because he's such a big human being. And uh, Gortat plays a lot of games, but at some point you'd think his body's going to maybe start to break down. So I wouldn't be surprised if Delgado got some minutes up top and maybe, you know, if you're streaming something and you might want to throw, a, you know, fly into the water and see if you can get 10 rebounds or something like that he might be useful but motley i'm not too sure he's still got to work on his scoring his defense is okay but i think out of those two delgado would be the one to maybe keep on your you know pretty wide radar i actually go i look at the other way i think motley's probably the more interesting guy and maybe Mm. it's skewed by what he did last season the last four games of last season for dallas 14 and 8, 26 and 12, 4 and 5, and 21 and 6. Yes, it was when Dallas was trying their best to lose in two of those games. He played over 40 <laughs> minutes, but he scored in big amounts. But he does nothing defensively. He can't protect the rim either. He, I, yeah. I don't think he, how many shots did he block? He blocked two shots in the 175 minutes that he played, which is clearly not a uh, not a huge amount. So he's not a big help there, but he can be a rebounding and points sort of a guy. But of course, this is all going to come down to what happens in that front court. And the guard depth is pretty, there's a lot there. The front court, not so much. Yeah. So one of these guys yeah. goes down, there is an opportunity for either Delgado or Motley to uh, to jump into things. So that will be interesting. It will be interesting to see exactly how that pans out over the course of the season. Now, Charles, with this team, is there anything that you can see changing in terms of you know style-wise or the way that they run things for this upcoming season with these players coming back? Or is it going to be more of the same of what we saw from uh, Doc Rivers and the Clippers last season? I think it's maybe going to start out as he's going to try and keep it more of the same, but the team is so new. You know, there's so many new pieces that are fairly large. We had the two draft picks, which is in and of itself pretty big. We brought in Mike Scott. We brought in Marcin Gortat. You know, I think I think the offense is going to start to gel a little in the beginning, and I hope we can get to that the play style last year because it was a little gritty. It was a little kind of, you know, hustle-filled, which was nice. So we got a lot of guys – who want to put their nose down to the grindstone and just kind of run it out. So I think we might try and see, I think defensively we have some pairings that are going to be really interesting. I think Avery Bradley and Patrick Beverly on the floor at the same time is a pretty big problem um, for any opposing offense. So the defense might be slow, but I think offensively, if the young guys get minutes, like if Shea starts to impress, they're going to be running a lot. Cause like you said, I think you said they're kind of treading water. So we're going to be down in a lot of games and there's going to be, I think a lot of shots flying uh, towards later parts of games let's talk about the guy that you listed as the most likely to be traded on that this team and it is a guy that was actually traded into this team last season and that is Avery Bradley he struggled uh with a groin injury all of last season I'm not going to say that I could predict that he was going to have a groin injury but I did uh, did suggest (laughs) pretty significantly last season that he was going to have a big downturn in his numbers playing alongside Andre Drummond because the big reason for his spike in value the year before was playing on a Celtics team that struggled to rebound and he was grabbing every rebound That went back Mm -hmm. to his career numbers, and we saw that last year. But the other thing that happened is he forgot how to shoot. So I'm not really sure what we're getting out of Avery Bradley this season. Again, crowded guard rotation. Lou Williams is a superior player to Avery. It feels like he's a a, Bradley's a little bit overrated. He was the 177th ranked player last season in over 31 minutes per game. Shows you just how you know not good he was because in in normally a guy who's (laughs) a, a good player in 31 minutes will put up top 100 type numbers. He struggled. Yeah. He got no rebounds, no assists. The steals were low. His field goal percentage was was terrible. Is there any hope of an Avery Bradley bounce back? I, I personally don't really feel it. I think the only real bounce back we're going to maybe see would be defensively. I think he just might pick his defense up a little bit because he can kind of lean on that to when he's playing badly. But I, I kind of tend to agree with you here. I think the numbers will go up a little bit, but I don't think they'll be anywhere near what they were 
you know, kind of when I think he got his overrated status when he was in Boston. Um, you know, DeAndre's gone, as we've mentioned, so the rebounds are probably going to go up a little bit, but nothing significant. I don't think he'll be seeing a ton of minutes. He might be starting, but I think with how many guards we have, there's going to be a lot of rotation, especially early in the season. So he might not even be able to get a rhythm if he does end up getting going. Yeah, that's, that's sort of how I view him as well. And it's interesting, you go back through his past few years, and the rebounding, you go to per 36, yeah. 3.6, 3.1, 6.6, <laughs> and then 2.9. You go, well, something there doesn't stand out. And then you go to his steals numbers. Again, always graded as this high defensive, you're really good defender. But for fantasy, it just doesn't translate. Steals per yeah. 36, 1.2, that's not good. 1.7, that is good. <laughs> but then 1.3 and 1.3. So which one is the real Avery Bradley with the steals numbers? Which one is the real one with the rebounds? I'll tell you one thing, we're not getting assists out of him. Uh, and the field goal percentage, yeah. 43, 45, 46, 41. Now, I, I do imagine that field goal percentage bumps back up, but I, I just don't see the value in Avery Bradley. He's ranked 103rd on Yahoo, got an ADP of 123. I will take Patrick Beverly and I will take Danilo Gallinari over him pretty com- comfortably. I could end up being very, very wrong with this, but uh, <laughs> obviously at the moment, I don't think that I am. Yeah, I don't think he'll be too far off on that. That's a pretty incredible ADP, I think, uh, for someone who, yeah, I mean, hasn't really impressed and might not. I, I put him on that trade as the most tradable just because his contract is so friendly and if he maybe gets hot you know the Clippers are looking to add cap space and picks because as you know we're looking towards next year kind of already so uh, he might be a piece that gets moved if he gets a little hot streak too yeah and uh, again even if he does get moved I don't really see him going into some situation where he becomes this excellent fantasy option so don't get too excited yeah. about him <laughs> as, uh, as he moves forward uh, during the season now the draft we've referenced it a couple of times the Clippers had two lottery picks they traded one of them to Charlotte to move up one pick to get Shea Gilgis Alexander and they got uh, I think shocking pretty much everyone Jerome Robinson at number 13 yes. let's talk about the player who, who is actually good and that is Gil- Gilgis Alexander who looked really good in summer league attacked the basket got there whenever he wanted to the Shot looked a little bit better than what we'd seen in the past. But of course, the concern with Shea, I've got him as my eighth best rookie in this class for dynasty value. But for this season, as we've referenced, it's going to be hard to see him getting on the court enough and consistently enough, especially considering rookies and point guards suck in their first year. It feels like it's going to be hard for for Shea to have a a huge impact this season. I think, yeah, numbers wise, he's not going to put up anything too mind boggling, you know, but I think. Uh, I think his efficiency is going to be really good. I think he's, he's going to be a guy who's maybe field goal percentage is going to be nice when he can get to the rim. He can finish, you know, with kind of either hand. He's he's skinny, so hopefully he kind of adds some weight slowly so he can kind of bounce around. But he's not a guy who looks for contact. He's a very smooth player. And I think I personally just like those guys for field goal percentage. They're never too out of control and stuff like that. If they get off rhythm, they can kind of smooth their way, if you will, back into it. And so percentage wise, I think he's going to be good. But there might be some injuries and he might get thrust into some more minutes. So I think if you get Shea, you're hoping that he has high percentages and then really holding out hope, I guess, that there's some injuries and he kind of steps up in that rotation. He shot 82% from uh, from the free throw line in college. So that's a, a good a good positive there. He shot 40% from uh, from three as well, despite being classified as, as not a good shooter and it gets to the rim pretty mm-hmm. well. But again, rookie point guards often struggle significantly with their efficiency in the first couple of months. And he's a guy that you're just going to need to watch to see if Bradley gets traded, to see if uh, yeah, Beverly's not right, to see what they do with Milos and to see if he just outplays everybody, which again, at this point, seems like it's going to be a, a tough one to uh, to do. The other guy, Jerome Robinson, well, I just don't really see him playing at all for this team. Uh, a lot of Agua Caliente Clippers time for Jerome. We talk about Shea <laughs> being maybe the fifth guard or sixth guard, like Jerome moves down there and he's battling guys like uh, Jawan Evans and Sindarius Thornwell for playing time. And I'm just, I, and I don't like this guy. I don't like the pick. I don't, not that I don't like the guy. I'm sure he's a great bloke. I just don't like I don't like the idea of the pick at that stage. I don't like his fantasy value, and he's not going to have an impact this season. I th- I mean, the, I will agree that the pick I think surprised most, if not all, Clippers fans. I had to do some research after they made the pick. He's a guy. I mean, there was the rookie survey recently, and he was voted by his other rookies as maybe the guy who might have the best career. Just an absolutely um, crazy vote, to be honest. <laughs> well, also uh, Luka Doncic didn't even make that list, despite having Nonsense. already a better career than all of those. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think Jerome, the Clippers really liked him. They flew him out after he graduated, and he basically just worked out with the Clippers uh, staff for a couple of months. And so, you know, this is a thing where you just kind of got to shrug your shoulders and say, I hope Jerry West knows what he's doing. Uh, I, I hope he gets some 
quality minutes for the Agua Caliente Clippers and maybe some time uh, up with the big guys if Bradley gets traded or if, you know, we decide to maybe tank, a.k.a. give our young guys some playing time. So, yeah, I mean, I don't really think you need to be excited. He's more of a, a fans player, I guess, as someone who we hope sees minutes. But he, he was a first-round pick, so they might try him out. But I'm not – I wouldn't – yeah, I would expect much more from Shea than I would from – uh, Jerome. Yeah, Hashim Fabit was also a first-round pick, so we'll see how that <laughs> how that works out for Jerome Robinson. Now, one thing with Robinson is he can shoot. We know he's going to be able to you know, shoot threes at a pretty decent yeah. level, I, I believe. 38% in college, 37% in summer league, and look pretty solid. The thing is, he gets no rebounds, no assists, no steals, uh, no blocks. He's not helping you in, in those areas you know, really at all. Free throws are you know, middling for a guy who's a good shooter. 76% is not good, and that can easily improve, and he could become an 80% guy. No problem there, but it's not going to get to the line huge amounts, and it's just not going to have the opportunity. So I don't really like him long-term as a massive dynasty guy because his game is just very much not well-rounded in terms of you know, his ability to contribute in multiple statistical categories. So didn't like the pick at the time, and I just don't think we're going to have a huge impact from uh, – Jerome Robinson this season. The projected yeah, stuff. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, it's going to be, he might be one of those guys who comes in and has a couple good games, but I mean, Dynasty, maybe take a look at him really late, but I think you can kind of maybe let Jerome chill on the wire. I, I agree with that. The projected starting five, we've gone with Patrick Beverly, Avery Bradley, the Rooster Danilo Gallinari, Tobias Harris, and Marcin Gortat. We've spoken about the first three of those guys there, so let's talk about Tobias Harris, who was unbelievable for this team when he came across. He ended last season as the 55th ranked player overall, played in 80 games in 33 minutes in both Detroit and in LA. But over the last two months of the season, after the trade, he was the 28th ranked player, scoring almost 20 points per game, hitting over two two threes per game and hitting 44% of his threes, six rebounds, yeah, 85% and established himself as, I guess you could make the debate with Lou Williams, but probably the best player on this Clippers team. He has been consistently underrated throughout his career, I believe. I think he's got a chance of mm -hmm. being a top 50 guy this season and he should be the lead guy again on this team. And I don't think that he'll necessarily be a top 30 guy that we saw post All-Star because we have to welcome back the Rooster into more playing time and Patrick Beverly. Um, into this squad, but he's a pretty strong lock for the top uh, 50 and uh, probably a top 40 guy as well. Yeah, I, I, I love Tobias. I think, you know, 19 and 6, I totally agree with you how he's criminally kind of been underrated his whole career. I think, uh, you know, Gallinari is healthy as of this very second. You know, yep. as I finish this sentence, he might not be. So That's true. <laughs> it gets to a thing. <laughs> it gets to a thing where I think Tobias is, I don't think his numbers are going to go down. I think his rebounds are maybe actually going to go up I just agree. because of the absence of. DeAndre, um, but I think there's no doubt in my mind that Tobias could put up maybe over 25 points a game this season if things gel in the offense, because if Lou takes a back seat with those minutes, then I think there are Tobias is to grab, and I think Tobias is really ready. You know, he turned down the contract extension, but that was kind of a money issue. But I think Tobias, he's got one more big contract in his career, so I think really this year he wants to prove what he can do and hopefully stay with the Clippers. But I think this year might be, uh, I think it's going to be the best year he's had. Yeah, look, he's in a perfect spot now. He looked so comfortable. I really, really like Tobias Harris, mm -hmm. and uh, I think this is a, he's a strong, look, he probably doesn't have much scope to jump ahead of his rank of 37, and that's fine in those early rounds. Just get you a guy who's going to return that value. And I think out of all those, or not out of all of them, because there are other safe ones, but he is one of the safest guys around there. He's a perfect roto guy. He's going to contribute right mm -hmm. across the board. You know, the blocks marginally below average. The steals right on average. Rebounds marginally above average. Assists marginally below. He's just giving you perfect numbers in every category and then scoring well and doing it really, really efficiently. I'm big on Tobias Harris. I've been big on him since his days. Uh, probably you know, maybe not Milwaukee. Oh, yeah, maybe Milwaukee, but definitely in Orlando. And he's you know, been able to do all that stuff all the way through. The last member of the starting five is the Polish Hammer. It's Marcin Gortat. <laughs> who is being drafted as the 136th ranked player, uh, sorry, 171st oh, wow. ranked player. He has um, struggled quite a bit recently over the course of his career. He was the 180th ranked guy last season because A, he doesn't block shots, he doesn't get yeah. usage, um, he rebounds okay, but you know, eight and a half and seven and a half in 25 minutes, do we see any of the playing time going up this season? I, he is not a draftable guy in under any circumstance in any 12, 14 or 16 team leagues, in my opinion. No, I agree 100%. He was, I mean, he was a position group on the, that's the position group on the Clippers where I'm like, I mean, I guess if you want to 
you know, if, you must be a Clippers fan if you're taking these guys in your drafts, I guess would be the best way to put it for the centers. People uh, really believe yeah. in Marcin Gortat in fantasy, and they have for the last couple of years, and I've been off him for, for quite a while. Um, that They get really into me, oh, no, but he's you know, so solid. He's, he, he just isn't. Like, he just isn't. It's just straightforward. He's blocked 0.7 shots per game each of the last two seasons, <laughs> and at 35, yeah. you're not getting better in that area. And he's one of those guys who, you know, he's got good footwork and he sets good screens, so he's a fantastic basketball player. Absolutely. 100%. But for fantasy, it's uh, there's I mean, there's no reason to have him. Because, yeah, I mean, eight, you know, eight and a half, seven and a half. I mean, I guess his minutes will go up, but... But how much will they actually really go up, though? Yeah, how much are they going to go up? And he's not even guaranteed to remain the starter, should things, you know, pan out like I think they will with Trez just kind of taking that job from him. Exactly. Um, yeah, I've already talked about value picks so far. I think the Rooster, I think Pat Beverly are both really good. I think Tobias Harris and Lou Williams are in the right spot. Uh, Avery Bradley and Gortat are probably ranked a little bit too highly uh, as, as things currently stand on this team. But there is a guy that we do need to talk about because it is a fantasy basketball podcast and no fantasy basketball podcast can go without somebody talking about Boban Marjanovic. He was ludicrously <laughs> overhyped last season. I can't. Yeah. People that listen to this podcast will understand. Will remember me telling you there's absolutely no point wasting a pick on this guy. He comes in again as the third string center, who on a per minute basis, everything looks really sexy from Boban. But Charles, there's a reason that he doesn't play the big minutes to translate those into big numbers. Yeah, his, he is literally too large of a human being to play basketball, which is a very hard thing to do. But he just can't. He can't really stay on the floor. His injuries are they pile up. And he, you know, he doesn't have speed. He obviously has some defensive capabilities because of his large wingspan and stuff like that. Uh, I think the internet really probably helped out his overall ADP. Uh, the internet really loves Boban yep. and him and Toby have a great friendship, which is awesome. But I don't think translates well to fantasy basketball. <laughs> We know he's efficient. Like he's going to get a high field goal percentage. He shoots free throws well, and he can come in and, and put up double double in low minutes. Like the last two games of last season, twelve and nine in fourteen minutes, twelve and ten in thirteen minutes. That's great. But there are nights when he won't even be guaranteed to necessarily see the floor. And there'll be nights like the ones before that, where he had four and three in six minutes, or nine and four in fifteen, or zero and three in six minutes, or two and three in ten minutes. And all these bullshit performances aren't worth the occasional <laughs> real low end double double. And you know, even if he does start, what's the max you're going to get? And we all remember the game he had against Denver that really probably cost uh, the the, Den the Denver Nuggets a playoff spot where he had 18 and 6 oh, with yeah. two steals and a block. And we know that he just took over that second half, and that's great. It's one game out of out of 82 over the course of the season, and there is absolutely zero chance you should be drafting Boban in 12, 14, 16, 18 <laughs> team leagues. The hype will still be there in some spots, but go, oh, Gortat's not good, and Harrell's not a center, they're going to start Boban. Something will come out about Boban, I can guarantee. I, I, I will happily miss on Boban being a good fantasy player because yeah. the odds of it are not high and I'd rather be on the, I'm not wasting a pick in it, but if it works out, then good for you. It's not, yeah, <laughs> no, not for me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, they also brought in Luke Mamute and uh, Mike Scott. Who do you think is going to get more of those uh, backup minutes there, mainly at the four, but some of those at the three between Luke and uh, Prison Mike? I think it'll be Prison Mike, actually. Um, he shot 40% on three last year, I think taking two or maybe two and a half per game. So if you're, that's, I mean, that's encouraging for a team that's looking to space the floor now, especially with DeAndre being gone. We really got to try and maximize our shooters because we actually can. Um, I think Mike is going to maybe take, I think for defensive pairings, obviously you're going to put Luke out there and he's going to really lock it down. But I think Mike Scott's maybe the one to want uh, out of those two. Mike Scott played really well, played some backup center last season as well in Washington, shot the ball well. He doesn't do very much else apart from that, but can be an interesting steals streamer. Oh, sorry, three streamer. The guy I do want to just last play I want to mention here is uh, Cinderius Thornwell, a guy who projected out really well as a rookie you know, coming in uh, out of South Carolina, played a much larger role than anyone really anticipated last season. 73 games, 16 minutes, showed some flashes, but it feels like he is going to really be on the outside looking in this season. And the Clippers do need to cut someone, and I, I think it'll be Jawan Evans at, at this point, but uh, Thornwell may be on that bubble along with Wes Johnson. Yeah, I really hope it's not Thornwell. Last year, he definitely showed that he... Uh, you know, belongs in the NBA, can contribute. So there is going to be, he's maybe not really fantasy relevant. I hope he does stay on the team. Um, I think you're right about who's going to be cut. But, you know, if injuries pile up, he's a guy you should definitely put a waiver in. But there's no reason uh, to be, you know, having him on your big board or anything like that. He's an interesting, I think, uh, the, go ahead. I, I think the Clippers as a whole kind of have a lot of solid number two guys for your roster. 
Um, not anyone, you know, other than Tobias and Lou, but everyone else that's fantasy viable on the Clippers is kind of your number two guy for that position. Thornwell's got marginal interest in yeah, deep, deep league dynasty type of stuff, but nothing, mm-hmm. nothing too major. Um, again, that uh, bringing in two guards doesn't speak uh, highly as to how the Clippers necessarily <laughs> value him in, um, in in their future plans. Charles, I reckon that'll do us for today. Can you let us know, A, what's going on on Locked On Clippers? Because you are one of the new hosts of the Clippers show. So what's going on over there at the moment? Um, right now, just getting pretty excited. There is a pretty big, uh, the city passed an ordinance, you know, paving the way for the Clippers to get their new stadium started, which we're all pretty excited about. Kind of, there's going to be some renderings released soon. And yeah, we're really just trying to figure out who's going to get cut on this team and what this team is going to look like identity-wise. We really hope we can kind of get some defensive grit with uh, the cast of players we got and just kind of crossing our fingers, Doc plays the young guys. Go and check out Locked On Clippers. Don't hold your breath about Doc Rivers playing the young guys. Maybe he's turned over a new leaf. Probably not. We'll see how that exactly goes. Check out Charles over on Locked On Clippers. Uh, thank you for coming on and, uh, and chatting with us today, Charles. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good luck this year. Guys, make sure you're subscribing to this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, and on YouTube. Thumbs up, five stars. You know the drill. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Cinderius Thornwell.